while they're fixing the slides, so by way of disclaimer, as you can see from the program, I am, I am an arbitration practitioner, and I've been doing this for over 10 years. So when our moderator started the session by asking whether arbitration is viable, the question for me do, it doesn't even arise. Um, we've been always busy, even when our transactional colleagues had quieter times, but in the arbitration department, we always have a lot of work. So obviously our clients think that it's a viable alternative to litigation, and they keep using it a lot. Um, originally, I'm from the southern region of Ukraine, which is now Russian, so Russia for me is a very natural region to focus my practice upon, but I was also educated in France, so my second emerging market is French-speaking Africa. Today we're talking about Russia, though, and as you may know, for London lawyers, Russia has been providing a lot of work over the recent years, uh, both before the High Court but, and also in arbitration. And I'm not going to provide such a comprehensive overview of the Russian arbitration laws and um, issues as Carla did for Latin America just because it's impossible. There are too many. But I will focus on a few challenging points which you may want to be aware about when you do um, arbitration with Russian-related parties. So just by way of a brief introduction, what about Russian arbitration laws and Russian arbitration framework? You obviously have an international commercial arbitration law in Russia, which is all very nice. Um, it's largely based on the ancestral model law. Since 2013, though, the Russian authorities have been trying to uh, modernize the arbitration law, and in particular with respect to um, arbitrability of corporate disputes. Until now, the Russian courts have said that if you have a dispute about um, a corporate dispute, so such as title to shares or participation in Russian companies, it has to go to state arbitrage courts, which are state commercial courts, and it is not arbitrable. It is not in legislation, it was a position of the Russian courts, but obviously it's not something the Russian commercial community is very happy about. So they're trying to change that. Uh, they have, Russia has its own international commercial arbitration center, in Russia it's MUKAS, International Commercial Arbitration Court of the Chamber of Commerce. It's been promoting itself very heavily, and it's on a website. You can read that almost every case it hurts includes a foreign entity, etc. But uh, the truth to be said, it's not been very popular uh, for major disputes. And for major disputes, Russians, their companies, and uh, Russian-related parties, they still go to Western institutions. Historically, one of such institutions was the SEC, the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce, since the Soviet times. Also, some of the disputes go to the ICC, but mainly it's been the LCA, the London Court of International Arbitration. And as you may know, in many shareholders' agreements involving Russian entities, English law is the governing law of the dispute, and the forum will be either the, Lond the English courts or the London Court of International Arbitration. Um, and LCA uh, openly says that a third of all of its workload comes from Russia or Russian-related parties. When we say Russian-related, you can have a dispute between two Cyprus entities or a Russian entity or BVI entity and all other variation of offshores you can imagine, but ultimately you'll have a beneficial owner who is a Russian individual or Russian company. Um, one of the most recent issues which has arisen in the last couple of years is the sanctions and whether they have any impact on the desire of the Russian companies to go and arbitrate in London or in Paris or in Stockholm. And I must say the Asian institutions such as the Hong Kong Center, Singapore Arbitration Center, they've tried to take advantage of it. And you've seen all sorts of roadshow by the Singapore and Hong Kong and even Kuala Lumpur and what else in Moscow trying to convince Russians to switch from the LCA and to come to Hong Kong or to Singapore saying, you know, the West doesn't like you anymore, Europe imposes sanctions on you, you should come to Hong Kong. I'm not sure it's been that efficient so far. Um, and when you go to conferences in Russia and you talk to people, they still use LCA. And the LCA, CC, and the ICC, they've been very careful about trying and reassuring their Russian users. And they've even issued a joint paper a few months ago saying, don't worry, you can still come and arbitrate your disputes at Lon in London. It does, the sanctions do not affect you. Of course, it may affect in some very limited cases, for example, if one of the entities is actually on the sanctions list, then you have to obtain a special exemption to be able to receive funds from that party because you still have to pay the arbitral institutions, you still have to pay the arbitrators, and if the Russian entity is on the sanctioned list, you'll have to be exempted to obtain a special license. But other than that, the institutions are saying they have seen almost no impact 
on what they do with the Russian entities. Uh, and finally, if we're talking about fora for resolution of Russian-related disputes, it's English courts. And here I'm not talking only about you know, major litigations such as we've seen recently, like Berezovsky, Abramovich case, for example, but also English courts have been heavily used by Russians in aid and support of arbitrations. And this will be my second slide, because obviously for our clients, what is most important is the assets. You don't want just to obtain an empty win and you know, be so happy you won the arbitration, but ultimately you don't get anything because you can't find where the money is or you cannot enforce the award. So what we often have to do is while the arbitration process is still running on even before we start the arbitration process, is to consider whether we can find and preserve the assets which we will ultimately use to enforce the award. You're all familiar with the concept of Mareva injunctions, which are used in litigation, so the freezing orders issued by the English courts. Uh, and I'm not going to explain all the legal criteria to obtain one. But basically, it is used when there is a risk of dissipation of assets before the judgment is given. And um, in arbitration, the English courts have recognized that they also have this power under the Arbitration Act 1996 to issue freezing orders. And these freezing orders can be uh, active not only in England, but also worldwide. And that's what we call WFOs, Worldwide Freezing Orders. And they have been used very effectively in arbitration. Uh, you have a couple of quotes here, just because I can't resist quoting cases. So the first one is the Zambia case. And this was a worldwide freezing order in support of the London arbitration. So the arbitration was seated in London. But there were no assets in England. The arbitration award was going to be enforced in Zambia, but even then, the English court said, I still have the power to issue a worldwide freezing order to preserve the assets while the arbitral tribunal is doing its work. Uh, another example is Bel Air versus Basel. And again, the tribunal was still being constituted, and the asset in question was a presidential palace in Georgia, and it was the only asset of the respondent in the arbitration. And so the claimant was saying, look, while we are still constituting the tribunal, they're just going to sell it and that's going to be it. I'm not going to have, you know, there's no point for me to go into two, three years arbitration and get nothing then. So the English court agreed and they issued this order. Um, and finally, what you can do is, even if the arbitration is not seated in London, but you have some connection with England, and usually it's assets, you still can obtain and freeze an order. And that's the third example, the Mobile Chero case versus Venezuela. And in that case, the seat of the arbitration was New York, but there was some connection with England, in particular the assets. And the English court said, OK, I can see that the defendant took steps to dissipate assets in New York and in England, and that's why I'm competent to issue that injunction to preserve the assets for you to enforce later. Another interesting instrument is the Chabra injunction, and that's when you can obtain a freezer against a third party. So not against the respondent, but actually against a third party to the arbitration. Chabra is the name of the case, of the litigation case, but then it's been transposed and moved to the arbitration world. Um, and one of the recent examples is the Maximov case. So that was an LCA arbitration, London Court of International Arbitration, seed in London. The claimant was a Ukrainian bank. The respondent was Mr. Maximov, former president, accused of, president of the bank, uh, accused of the breach of the agreement, etc., etc. And the freezing order was asked by the bank and obtained not against Mr. Maximov, but against three English companies, which were said by the bank to be nominees of Mr. Maximov. And the court agreed and said effectively, these companies were controlled by him. And therefore, I will not bore with all details, but ultimately the result was that the assets of these companies would be available for enforcement of any award against Mr. Maximov. So because our ultimate purpose is to preserve any assets against which we can enforce the final award, and because these assets ultimately can be attached for enforcement of such an award, we have to preserve them now. And even though it's a third party, to the arbitration, I still issue a freezing order to preserve these assets. So 
Let's assume you preserve the assets, it's all very fine, and if they're elsewhere, it's okay, but what if the assets are in Russia and you have to actually go to Russia and enforce your work there? Russia is a signatory to the New York Convention, you know, 1958 Convention Governing Enforcement of Arbitral Awards. It's a founding member, so it signed it in 1958, although I think the first case for enforcement was brought in 1992 in Russia, which is not surprising considering that until 1992 it was not exactly um, the big era of commercial arbitration in the Russian Federation. Uh, Russian courts consider approximately 50, 70 applications to enforce annually, so it's not that many. Uh, some say it's because all the rest of the awards are complied with voluntarily. I think it's probably because all the rest of the awards are enforced somewhere else, because the assets are somewhere else, such as, you know, mansions in Belgravia or shares in Cypriot companies, etc., etc. But that's where we are. Until recently, um, Russian courts have been cr heavily criticized by using public policy to refuse to enforce awards, because the definition of public policy is very vague. You know it's one of the grounds to refuse enforcement um, under the New York Convention. And you can see the recent information letter uh, of the Supreme Arbitrage Court of Russian Federation where they define public policy. It still remains very vague. Most imperative principles, actions prohibited by the internationally mandatory norms, uh, affecting security or sovereignty of the state, go figure what it means for Russia at one particular point in time. So it's, it still remains very vague, but the record has actually been improving. So if um, a few years ago you could see some very absurd interpretations by Russian courts and anything could be interpreted to be violations of public Russian public policy, now it's no longer the case and they've actually been quite good. Um, and as a recent example, I chose the case of Buick, and that was an ICC award. The seat was Stockholm, uh, and uh, the respondent actually was trying to object to enforcement on various grounds, but these grounds were rejected by the courts. So, for example, the respondent was trying to say the penalties were excessive, rejected, interference with the merits um, of the dispute. And also, interestingly enough, uh, the proceedings to set aside the award were still ongoing, so the award was still being challenged in um, Sweden, but even then the Russian court said, I don't care, it's binding under the ACC rules, I enforce it. So the trend actually has been quite positive. Speaking of enforcement, and that will be the last sort of point to touch upon, um, the sort of most difficult issue relating to enforcement in Russia is if you are against the Russian state, which is, you know, good luck with that. Um, Russia is a signatory to the ICSID Convention, but it's not ratified. Uh, Russia was a signatory to the, Interne uh, to the Energy Charter Treaty, but, as you know, it was only applied provisionally, arguably, and then Russia exited in 2009. Then there are several bilateral investment treaties, BITS, under which investors can sue Russia and can make claims before international arbitral tribunals, such as, you know, Argentina did a lot of those over the recent years. The issue is though, okay, even if you get an award, what you're gonna do with it? Because you have to enforce it. Uh, and you cannot, you know, you have all these concepts of sovereign immunity, etc. so you cannot enforce it against sovereign assets. And I'll put the name of Sedelmeyer, in case you don't know him, Franz Sedelmeyer was a German investor who obtained an award against Russia in the early 90s. It took him, I think, I don't know, over 15 years to get something out of it, and he started over 80 proceedings all over the world, trying to seize all possible assets of Russia. He eventually managed to get um, a building in Cologne, I think, which um, used to belong to the Russian consul, to Russian trade mission, so Russia did have to sell it uh, at the auction and pay the auction proceeds to Mr. Sedelmeyer. Well, I think Russia itself actually bought it at the auction, so ultimately it was all pointless. But it took him a lot, a lot of time to get there, and I think he's now heading an international um, asset recovery firm. So he made a profession out of it because it took him so long to get there. He was like, yeah, I've got so much expertise now, I want to do that. Um, and obviously UCOS, and it's been in the news a lot recently, and it's a uh, very important um, issue for us. Uh, you all know what happened to the UCAS. There was an award uh, a couple of years ago. The U former UCAS shareholders got $50.50 billion for alleged expropriation by the Russian state, the biggest award in investment treaty arbitration. So that was, you know, in Russia it was a big thing. Uh, a lot of uh, people were criticized and a lot of criticism against the award, against the arbitrators, um, all they want. 
But a couple of months ago, in April, the Hague District Court set this award aside. Um, and it set this award aside on the basis that Russia signed the Energy Charter Treaty, which was the basis for jurisdiction of the tribunal, but it never ratified the Energy Charter Treaty. So when the arbitrators said that the Russia was bound by the ECT and the dispute resolution provisions it contained, actually the arbitrators were wrong. They didn't have jurisdiction to consider this dispute, so the awards are cancelled. Obviously, the UK's shareholders are now going to appeal that, and we're going to see what's going to happen. But still, it, it's been labeled as a major victory for uh, Russia and for its Dutch lawyers, I think. I think it's Albert Vandenberg who led the team. The issue, though, is enforcement. Because although the award has been set aside in the Netherlands, the former UK shareholders started proceedings to enforce the award all over the world. And in some jurisdictions, the fact that the award has been set aside doesn't actually affect enforcement that much. For English courts, yes. English courts generally will say is the issue is topple. If a foreign court said the award is no longer valid, I'm not going to interfere with that unless there is a major breach of public policy, etc. OK, I will respect that. But the French courts, for example, they consider an arbitral award to be grounded in some international legal order, which is all very abstract. So for them, they may actually accept to enforce the award, even though it's been set aside. So the Yucca saga still continues, and it's something we actually uh, look forward to with respect to all these enforcement developments, which may be very interesting in relation to Russia. One final point, which is not in the slide, but which you know uh, you mentioned before, it's about financing the proceedings and the issue of arbitration litigations becoming much longer, much more expensive. What we've seen in London generally, and also uh, increasingly so with Russian parties, is the rise of the third party funding. You know, you have now third party funders, so-called litigation funders, who can actually fund your case and fund legal fees obviously in return for a proportion of proceeds later on. So if you win, they'll get a share. And how big is the share depends on the merits of your case and how expensive it will be, etc. But for some of our clients, um, it's been quite a useful tool just because sometimes they're in a position where they don't want to put up cash right now to pay our fees. But if they get something in three years' time, and if that it's, you know, even if it's 50 or 70 percent of the original amount, it's still a good outcome. And so both for the, for the individuals and for corporate companies, it's actually been quite a developing market to put this risk and the payment of the fees on someone else. And then if you get something, great. If you don't get anything, the risk is on that litigation funder, not on you. So that's all from me. Thank you very much.